please, please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Professor Samantha Lawler studies the orbits of Kuiper Belt objects, exoplanets, and dusk disks using optical and near-infrared observations and dynamical, excuse me, dynamical mathematical simulations. She completed her undergraduate degree at Caltech, of course, followed by two years there working with the early Spitzer Space Telescope data. She then earned a master's degree from Wesleyan University and completed her PhD at the University of British Columbia. Then she did a postdoc at the University of Victoria and then a Pleskett, if I can pronounce that right, Pleskett, fellowship at NRC Hertzberg. Through all of this, somehow, she has found a remarkable balance. She is now an assistant professor of astronomy at Campion College at the University of Regina and lives on a 150 acre farm where she helps raise goats, chickens, and organic vegetables with her partner, and her kids while enjoying and trying to protect the huge prairie skies of her home in Saskatchewan. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. For that reason, right now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. Professor Samantha Baller, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. And please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. Thank you for having me today. Um, I had the privilege of observing on the 200 inch a few times um, years ago. Uh, I got married at Mount Wilson. I'm pretty sure that I, I was right down the hall from Tim Thompson um, during my first summer project at JPL as an undergrad. So I have a lot of connections here. So it's it's uh, nice nice to be here virtually. And now I live in Saskatchewan, which um, is literally the last place in the world I ever expected to live, but I love it here. So that's, uh, you know, just uh, interesting how my path has, has gone. So, um, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, I will uh, just, let me start off by saying, I apologize, this is gonna be a really depressing talk, but I'm gonna to try to focus a bit more on um, what we can still do, because there's there, this isn't all set in stone. This is what's happening right now, but it could change. So, um, okay, so just like some very basic background, right? Uh, astronomy, as we're all very aware, uh, astronomy is one of the most ancient sciences, right? There are these, um, observatory structures that have been built all over the world that are thousands of years old. Uh, humans have been looking up at the sky, noticing patterns, and making predictions based on those patterns for thousands of years. Um, I would argue that this is part of what makes us human. Um, and I want to especially acknowledge uh, uh, indigenous astronomy, um, the, the astronomy of uh, the, the people who live on the land that I now live on. Um, so uh, I, I'm speaking to you today from uh, Treaty 4 territory. This is the land of the Nahiawak, Anishinaapek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Métis Mishif. And all of these people have uh, active cultural practice and cultural heritage associated with stargazing. Um, so I am a settler on this land and an immigrant and I'm just learning about uh, all of this. So I'm not qualified to share this. Um, a couple of really good resources for learning more about this, astron this indigenous astronomy for those of you who are not indigenous. Um, uh, there's a fantastic book by Wilfred Buck that focuses on Cree astronomy and it's absolutely beautiful. I, I'm just, Every time that I've heard Wilfred Buck speak, it's just an absolutely uh, 
a totally moving experience for me. Um, and then this website, nativeskywatchers.com, has a lot of different um, indigenous traditional knowledge from a lot of different cultures. And it's also a fantastic resource. Um, OK, so you know we're, we're looking for these patterns in the sky. This is what we're still doing as astronomers, right? Our, our tools are a lot more sophisticated, uh, but we still have the same goals. We're looking for patterns. The patterns now are looking for exoplanets transiting in front of stars or magnetic fields around a supermassive black hole or uh, near Earth asteroid orbits, right? Um, but we're still, we still have the same goal of looking for patterns, making predictions, and avoiding catastrophe. It used to be avoiding catastrophe by knowing when to harvest certain foods or when to hunt certain foods. Now it's avoiding catastrophe by uh, finding that near Earth asteroid early enough that we can do something about it. Um, okay, so urban light pollution, we know, all of us here, uh, is already destroying access to the night sky, right? Most people, the vast majority of people in uh, the US and Europe live under light polluted skies. Um, most people can't see the Milky Way. Um, I thought that, you know, moving here to farmland and in, in the prairies, um, I thought that everybody would know about the Milky Way, but in my Astronomy 101 classes here, I ask students, how many of you have seen the Milky Way? Less than a third of them. It's really depressing. Um, and uh, this has gotten rapidly worse in the last few years uh, because of a leap in technology, LEDs, right? Um, so this is a good thing, right? Because it's, it's, uh, LEDs are much more energy efficient than incandescent lights, but because they're more efficient, they're cheaper and they're overused, right? So, uh, so this leap in technology um, has suddenly made the problem of light pollution much worse. And that's also uh, the, another leap in technology is uh, extending light pollution into space. And that's most of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so urban light pollution, you can get away from, right? California, there are lots of fantastically dark places. Um, if you if you head inland, mostly, right? Death Valley, Anza Borrego, um, uh, Joshua Tree, uh, you can get some really fantastically dark skies by heading out to the desert. Um, uh, and so my my personal connection to this, right? Um, so. Uh, so I, I got to, um, I got this job at the University of Regina um, a few years ago. Uh, uh, I, I now live on a farm. Um, I'm in the, the light green circle around the city of Regina. So I'm well within the, the light pollution dome from, uh, from the city, uh, but I can see the Milky Way from my back door, right? This is the first place that I've ever lived where I could do that. Uh, and I started noticing back in 2019 when I first moved here, um, there's a lot of satellites. What's happening with that? I've heard something about Starlink. What is that? Um, and so, so that sort of launched me on this, this journey. Um, so what is happening? Uh, so SpaceX, uh, an American private company, is launching batches of 60 satellites into low Earth orbit. Uh, I said every two to three weeks, but I've actually given different versions of this talk three times in the last 10 days, and I've had to update this number every single time. Uh, so uh, there's currently 2,405 Starlinks in orbit. Um, and they have a huge failure rate, you'll see. Um, they're made uh, fast and cheap. Um, you can see, uh, so this is the, the number of satellites over time. You can see that it has just shot up in the last couple of years. And um, this is almost entirely due to Starlink. Um, so they're almost at half of all active satellites. So it depends on how you, how you count and, um, and how you, it's actually quite confusing to try to count how many satellites there are in orbit. There's something like 5,000. Uh, by the end of the year, it's safe to say that SpaceX one American private company will own more than half of all active satellites. They have permission to launch 42,000 satellites, right? 10 times more satellites than have ever been in orbit before. Um, here's a nice graphical way of looking at this. Um, so the area of this rectangle uh, represents how many, what fraction of satellites are owned by different entities. This was made by Chris Van Eyck. Um, so Starlink, uh, as of uh, February was 36%, uh, one American private company, right? So they own more satellites than any other government or entity in the world, right? Um, compared to the rest of the US, uh, both the US military and US private companies, 
Um, they own more than the entire global north and you know way more the entire global south all countries in the global south own less than five percent of all satellites right so space is supposed to be a shared resource orbit is supposed to be a shared resource it is clearly not being shared equally um okay so the purpose of starlink satellites is to provide uh global internet access and you know, obviously this is something that, especially during the pandemic, when so many of us are working from home and schooling from home and giving talks from home, uh, this is vastly important, right? Um, but, uh, you know, you hear, okay, well, Starlink is gonna bring, uh, bring the internet to the first time for these underserved places in Africa or whatever, right? You hear that story a lot. Um, but if you look at, okay, so this, this chart uh, is from a paper by Meredith Rawls, um, this is how much does it cost to, to pay for that satellite internet versus GDP for different countries. Uh, and this is the per percentage of people in different countries with access to the internet, right? So, so places where a large fraction of the population already has access to the internet, you don't really need this, right? There's other ways you can get that last last bit of people access and places where it's too expensive right where where it costs more than five percent of your income you're not going to spend more than five percent of your entire income on internet right you can't um so uh so the place where it's needed is this corner of the plot where the legend is and there are no countries right so obviously this is a huge oversimplification right there are places in northern canada and the rural us where there is no good internet access and starlink is the best option i totally realize that but uh the idea that this is going to bring internet to the world is not true right spacex is not a charity they are a very profitable company they're doing this for money they're going to do it for this this part up here where where people already a large fraction of people in the countries have access to internet and can afford to pay for uh for more access right um so that's important to keep in mind um Okay, so, so SpaceX is kind of on the leading edge of this, but there are tons of other companies, terrifying number of companies that are lined up to do the exact same thing, right? Amazon, One, OneWeb, uh, a whole bunch of other companies. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's not at all a good regulatory framework for this, like nothing really. Uh, in, in order to, um, to get permission, to broadcast, you, you have to get permission to broadcast to different countries. There's effectively no control at all of orbital space, none. Uh, you just have to get permission. So SpaceX has to get permission from the US uh, FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which is designed to regulate radio bands, not to regulate orbit. Um, if they wanna broadcast to Canadians, they have to get permission from, from our, our uh, uh, regulatory body. Um, there is an international one also, but again, it's for regulating broadcasts. It's not for regulating orbit. So there is one co one country, uh, one company in Rwanda has filed for 300,000 satellites, which to my knowledge, Rwanda has no space program currently. So uh, this is either a brilliant political move or a joke of some kind, and I'm not really sure. Um, so, so why is this a problem? Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of different reasons why this is a problem, but because um, most of us are very deeply connected to astronomy, I'm going to start with uh, the problem for astronomy. So, so these satellites are bright and reflective, right? Um, so they, uh, they reflect sunlight long after the, the sun is down because they're on high altitude orbits. Um, so, you know, it used to be like, I would look up when the space station was gonna fly over and I'd run outside and, you know, wave at the astronauts. Like I remember doing that like all through high school even. And, uh, but now there are satellites everywhere. We've gone through this transition point where, you know, it's kind of like um, analogy I use a lot is, uh, you know, it's like the first car, right? You, you see a Model T driving down your road, you run out to look at it. But now we live next to a freeway. So you, it's it's boring, right? Uh, we, we've crossed this point. There are satellites everywhere. And there are no rules about how bright they can be or what orbits they can use or launch regulation. There's really not many rules at all. So this is um, the companies that have launched them so far have put almost no effort into making them fainter. Um, so how bright are they? Um, so I'm going to show a bunch of plots with uh, apparent visual magnitude on them. So 
Uh, some of you are very familiar with this. Some of you probably are not so familiar with it. So, uh, so this is this uh, silly logarithmic scale that astronomers love using. Um, basically, what you need to know is numbers that are smaller than six and a half are what you can see with your unaided eyes. Um, so brighter than five is kind of about what you can see in a light polluted suburb. Um, four is getting pretty bright. So, uh, so this is the distribution of uh, the original starlings. Uh, and you can see they are quite visible, right? All of them are naked eye visible. And, uh, and, and most of them are visible from even a fairly light polluted place. So, um, so astronomers yelled a lot about this initially and, and Starlink did actually try to mitigate. Uh, first, they tried basically painting one black um, that caused it to overheat and fry itself. So that didn't work. Uh, then they tried adding visors to their, their satellites and they made a big deal out of that. Lots of press. Um, it did actually make them quite a bit fainter, but they have stopped doing that with no press. Uh, so, uh, so they did, they did try something, but uh, this, this interferes with some other aspect of their satellite operations. So they have, are not mitigating them anymore. Um, so this is, this is the, the visor sats, the ones that were fainter, right? So they're quite a bit fainter, right? Um, they're still like half of them or so are still naked eye visible, um, but all of the, uh, the original starlings are naked eye visible. So, um, so that's, uh, <laughs> they're, they're really bright. Um, and uh, seventh magnitude, if they're brighter than seventh magnitude, that's when it starts to cause major problems for, uh, you know, cameras and very big telescopes. So like, uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, for example, um, uh, a brighter than seventh magnitude, you start to get like crosstalk between the CCDs, you start to get persistence between uh, successive exposures, right? It starts to cause major problems. So below seventh magnitude, which is what SpaceX has said that they were going to try to do, but they haven't, um, that would be fantastic. And it also has the added bonus that it's faint enough that you can't see it with your eyes. Um, okay, so Probably all of you have seen pictures like this, right? Uh, these these uh, Starlink satellites are on kind of a grid. So if you do a long time exposure uh, astrophoto, uh, you will get many of them passing through, uh, following each other, right? Um, passing through what you know, whatever lovely comet or galaxy you're trying to to photograph. Um, for research astronomy, obviously, this is this is a, a much bigger problem um, because we uh, not only use really fancy cameras, but we also stare at a spot on the sky for a long time, right? So, so this is uh, from a camera a, a telescope in Chile, right? This is a worldwide problem. Um, and then I hear a lot, well, why don't you just send all your telescopes into space? Well, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope, right? Eve, so the Hubble Space Telescope is on the same kind of orbit as Starlinks, right? So uh, Hubble Space Telescope has the exact same problem. So um, uh, JWST will not have this problem because it's not in Earth orbit. But, uh, you know, uh, we only get so many $10 billion telescopes, right? Uh, <laughs> unless uh, certain billionaires want to uh, give us some money. Um, okay, so this is my data from the, the Canada-France Hawaii telescope. Um, I'm looking for Kuiper belt objects. Uh, so um, this is just a raw image. So the vertical lines are just um, bleeding from very bright stars. That's normal. This diagonal is a Starlink. And this is more Starlinks and more Starlinks and more Starlinks, right? So, so I've noticed, I've had this program uh, looking for Kuiper Belt objects in a specific patch of sky um, for the last couple of years. And it's noticeable how many more satellites there are in my, in my images now than there were two years ago. Um, right, and even in these little tiny thumbnails where those, that's what I'm looking for, these little tiny faint Kuiper Belt objects, right? So, so a seventh magnitude, yeah, a seventh magnitude, most of them are brighter, a seventh magnitude uh, Starlink flying through is, uh, is 15 million times brighter than this uh, this little faint Kuiper belt object that I'm trying to find, right? So this is quite a problem for research astronomy. Um, okay, and then there's, so when Starlinks first launch, they're uh, very close together on uh, a very uh, tight, uh, tightly packed orbit. Um, and it just looks like your eye actually cannot resolve the individual satellites. It just looks like a line moving across the sky. 
uh, people all over the world are seeing this. Um, so <laughs> the New York Times had this article about like, oh my gosh, like everybody's going crazy because of the pandemic and everybody thinks they're seeing UFOs. No, it's Starlink. It is Starlink, 100% Starlink. I personally have, like probably those of you who work in public relations at, at observatories have had the same problem. There are so many people are seeing these and reporting them as UFOs. I was on a radio show in South Korea where they asked me about this happening over India, right? Like everyone in the world has seen this and SpaceX is doing zero public outreach, none. It really, really annoys me. Um, okay, so I wanted to find out, so how bad is this going to get? Um, so uh, if you look at uh, four companies that have made credible progress toward, toward launching lots of satellites, um, Starlink, Kuiper, OneWeb, and uh, Starnet, that's 65,000 satellites. And uh, like a good academic, <laughs> the best way to find out what's going to happen is to write a research paper on it. Um, so this is uh, the orbits the, that um, this is satellites distributed on the orbits that these companies have filed for. So this is what they are planning to do as of right now or, or as of uh, a few months ago when I wrote the paper. Um, so you can see there are so many. This is what 65,000 satellites uh, snapshot of them on their orbits looks like. Right. Um, and you'll notice in particular, there's like these bands of higher density. Um, so that's that's a choice that has been made by. Uh, by the companies uh, for for coverage reasons, right? So, but that means that there are places on Earth where uh, the satellite um, light pollution is actually worse. Um, okay, so now, uh, so now we take that um, distribution of orbits and put it around the Earth. Imagine the Earth is in the middle of this. Um, so the sun is off in this direction, right? Lighting up all of these satellites. Um, you'll see there's kind of a hole in the back here. That's the Earth's shadow passing through the shell of satellites, right? So back here, there's no sunlit satellites because they're blocked by the Earth's shadow. Um, and you know, on this side over here, it's daytime, so you can't see the satellites. Um, so now if we look at number density. So now the color is telling you how many satellites are in your sky and sunlit at different times of night and different latitudes on the earth, right? So, um, so you guys are uh, about latitude 30-ish, 35-ish. Um, so right at, at sunset on the equinox, um, there are uh, something like uh, almost 3,000 sunlit satellites in your sky and that drops off. So you get, you get some period where there are very few satellites that are sunlit and then goes back up toward uh, sunrise. And this will depend on the season too, right? So now looking on the summer solstice, you'll have uh, more uh, satellites um, all night long. So we'll, I'll look at this more in detail later. Um, but okay, so now, so we know how many satellites there are in the sky and how many are sunlit, right? That's just geometry. Um, but uh, now how bright are they going to be? That gets more complicated. It depends on the shape of the satellites. It depends on, you know, their orbital height. It depends on what materials they're made out of. And that is not information that the satellite companies share. So we have to, uh, you know, do the physics thing, the standard uh, silly thing that we physicists like to do and assume a sphere, right? So that's, that's the standard joke, right? Uh, physicists assume that everything uh, just a, just approximated as a sphere, right? Like, uh, so, so we, we use this, this terrible equation that goes with, uh, a sphere, right? I totally realize this is a terrible approximation, right? Uh, Sputnik was a sphere, sure, but Starlink satellites, there's nothing spherical about them, but we did to, to our credit, we did try, uh, more complicated models and they didn't actually fit the data any better. So, uh, so we'll just go with the spherical cow model for now. So, so this, this equation looks terrible, but it's actually not too bad. It's um, the, the brightness of the sun. Um, it has this uh, a phase angle. So that's the angle between you on the ground, the sun and the satellite, right? So how, how much of the satellite is lit up basically. Um, and then the distance between you and the satellite. Um, and then uh, the term that we are going to vary to match our data is the effective area. So this depends on uh, albedo, so how reflective the satellites are, and the cross-sectional area, how big they are. 
Um, okay, so now we have our spherical cow model. Now we can calibrate it to real starling data. Um, and so this, this was a, a Canadian team. Uh, we were specifically uh, wondering what's going to happen over us because, as you saw, one of those high density bands goes right over me. <laughs> so I wanted to find out. So how is this going to affect us up in Canada? But our models are applicable to the whole world. So. Um, so three Canadian astronomers um, using uh, a telescope in Canada. Um, we observed starlings on purpose, measured their brightness. Um, we tried initially to just do the visor sats, hoping that all would be visor sats, but then we found out that they're not all going to be visor sats. So we just observed any starlings that were in the field of view. Um, and uh, so this is how we calibrated our model. So the blue is showing our actual measurements. Um, the gray is our, our model just to kind of, you know, so we shifted around based on the size and the reflectivity of the satellites. Uh, you'll notice that most of these satellites are naked eye visible, which is obnoxious, um, <laughs> but that's, that's where we are. Um, okay, so, so the best fit that we came up with uh, is pretty realistic. It could correspond to an albedo of 0.2, which is reasonable for metal, um, and uh, a size of four meters squared, which is pretty close to a Starlink, right? They're big. Um, Okay, so uh, so there's there's been a lot of work on this previously, trying to make these predictions, but the situation is changing so fast that the numbers are are already outdated, even a couple of years ago. Um, so okay, so we we have our our spherical cow model that's now calibrated nicely to real data. We have uh, the satellites on their orbits that that, that these companies have asked for. Um, and then we use uh, open source uh, orbital simulations, right? So how are these satellites going to move over time? Um, and uh, any of you who are our coders, um, our, our code is all publicly available on GitHub. Um, there is a web app on this, this website. Um, so you can kind of play with our models without having any, any coding knowledge. Um, and uh, Hannah Ryan, my co-author, has written uh, an, uh, an Apple device app uh, that's free in the, the App Store called Mega Constellations, and that has a little bit more realistic interface. <clears throat> so what do we find out? Uh, so this is, this is uh, Hawaii. So I'm going to show you um, uh, a, a few plots like this. So each of these circles is an all-sky view. Uh, right, so the, there's the, the directions around the edge that's that's straight up in the middle. Um, this uh, the colors are showing the brightness of satellites that are in your sky, um, and uh, so so orange or yellow is naked eye visible, and then it tells you the number of visible satellites and the number of sunlit satellites in the sky. Um, and so then uh, this uh, row is at sunset. This is at midnight. Or sorry, this is. Uh, at dusk, so after sunset, when it's starting to get dark, this is midnight, this is uh, morning, just when it's starting to get light. And then this is on the winter solstice, the equinox, and the summer solstice. So this is from Hawaii. So you can see that uh, from Hawaii at midnight, uh, it, even on the summer solstice, there's only a few satellites that are faint and uh, to the northern uh, horizon. Um, this is from my house. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, from latitude 50 degrees north. You can see that on the summer solstice, there are a couple hundred naked eye visible satellites all night long. So remember that there's only about 4,000 naked eye visible stars in the sky. When there's 200 naked eye visible satellites all close to Zenith, um, that's, that's quite a different looking sky. I'm gonna show you a quick movie. I'm not sure how well this will come through, but um, so here's the number of visible satellites, the number of sunlit satellites, the time, right? So it gets dark around 10 here on the, the summer solstice, maybe a little later. Um, but you can see like the, the yellow and, and orange points are the ones that are naked eye visible and they just sit at the zenith all night long. Really an annoying. Um, okay, and here's uh, Los Angeles, latitude 34. So, um, so it's not as bad on the summer solstice, but you have oh, one or two uh, even all night long. So let, let's look at how that changes. Um, so uh, the number of uh, visible satellites is in the dozens. Uh, 
you know, within a couple hours of sunset, uh, it drops steadily to, to midnight when you just have a couple uh, that are naked eye visible. So, uh, so you do get some time in the middle of the night, even in the summer when there are no sunlit satellites or very few sunlit naked eye visible satellites, uh, but you'll have to be careful about where you do your observations still. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, even if you go to the North Pole, uh, there are still uh, a couple dozen satellites that are, are visible, right? You cannot escape this light pollution like you can urban light pollution. Even if you go to the North Pole, there are still sunlit satellites. Um, this will affect everyone in the world, regardless of whether or not they can access or afford Starlink internet. Um, okay, so uh, so one of the recommendations from uh, these uh, SATCON reports uh, was uh, what if we, um, we should recommend that satellite companies uh, bring their satellites to lower orbits because they'll be brighter, but they'll move across the field of view faster, right? So if you're using a telescope, it'll smear the light across more pixels, and that's maybe easier to get rid of. So uh, so what does that look like with our model? Um, so now I've got a whole bunch of these, these all sky views. Um, so, uh, so I've got, I've taken all of the satellites and put them at either 550 kilometers, which is where Starlink orbits, or at 1200 kilometers, which is where OneWeb orbits, right? So the higher altitude, lower altitude. Um, and then this is uh, nautical dusk, so just after sunset, and this is at midnight. And uh, so again, the, the orange and yellow are the ones you can see with your naked eye. Um, so you can see that uh, if you have uh, these lower altitude orbits, the light pollution is worse. Oh, I'm sorry. And these are different, different latitudes on Earth, right? Um, so you're, I don't know, somewhere in between these two. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, so at, at midnight uh, on the summer solstice, uh, it's terrible for me, right? Hundreds of naked eye visible satellites. Uh, it's it's better if they're at higher altitude. If I'm trying to uh, do do naked eye observing, right? Um, uh, but if you have the higher altitude orbits, then it affects more of the world than if you have the lower altitude orbits, right? So so. What I was trying to, to show with this is that there's no magic solution. You can't just say, oh, well, if we just put them all on the same orbit, then it'll all be fine. That doesn't actually help. It depends on what your, your goals are. And there are different users of the sky who have different goals in different parts of the world. So uh, yeah, if you, and, and presumably if um, everyone moved their satellites to lower altitude orbits, they would all want more because now you're moving faster across the sky. So you need more satellites to provide the same coverage on the ground. So, uh, so this is, this is not, a, not a viable solution. Okay, um, so I went through a lot of uh, the astronomy stuff. I'm gonna, the rest of my talk focuses on uh, sort of uh, some other um, problems uh, that are caused by so many satellites. So maybe this is a good time to pause and see if there's any questions quickly before I go on to the, the um, to talk about other problems. Anyone has a question? No? Well, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, was SpaceX has been sort of talking about this for a long time. Was there any effort made to develop some regulatory framework before they started putting them up? Yeah, that is an excellent question. So I, I personally did not become aware of this until it really started happening. Um, I, but I'm also like fairly like I just became a professor a couple of years ago, right? So uh, I there there were I'm sure there was somebody who was aware of this, um, but uh, I don't I think everyone has been pretty surprised by how like everyone governments astronomers everyone has been sort of surprised by how fast SpaceX is moving on this. So um, yeah, that's a good question. It would have been fantastic to have regulations in place five years ago, but that's not where we are. I have a question. Yeah. Even if the satellites are made dark or black, would they also be occulting the stars anyway? Yep. Yes, they would be. Um, so depending on what kind of science you're trying to do, that could also cause problems, right? Um, particularly for uh, trying to find 
uh, Oort cloud objects by uh, microlensing, right? That's going to totally screw up those signals. Um, if you're looking at uh, exoplanet transits, it's not going to be a big deal because the um, they'll pa the satellites will pass in front of stars so quickly. But um, that's the, there's yeah that one science case that I I thought of for sure would be affected. There's probably other science cases that would also be affected. Um, so yeah, it doesn't it doesn't just go away. I it goes away from naked eye observing, but yeah. All right, go ahead. Oh, sorry. The question is uh, regarding Mount Wilson and Palomar. Has mm -hmm. Mount Wilson and Palomar then been talking about this issue? That would be a better question for the people who work there. So maybe right. let's let's come back to that one at the end because I'm going to okay. talk about a little bit more policy stuff. But I would also be interested to know <laughs> right. you know the answer to that. Okay, um, let me jump in with a question. Sure. You mentioned that the Starlight. Starlink satellites were kind of cheaply built and have a short lifetime. Yes. What what is the lifetime? And uh, would that I will I will go into that in, in a little bit and some of okay. the problems from that. Will so, that give us yeah. an opportunity if they have to be reseeded? Yes. And something be done with the next generation of them to yes. reduce this problem. Yeah. And that is that is a place to have a little bit of hope, definitely. I have one short comment. I know the United Nations uh, recently completed their uh, first assessment for the dark and quiet skies yep. initiative, but that's more advisory than regulatory. Do you think that will eventually lead into anything? Yes, I think it will eventually, but it'll take years. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. I, I know yeah. someone who did the, the medical thing for that for the LEDs. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very slow. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll keep going and we'll come back for more questions. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I talked about uh, light pollution a lot. Now I want to talk about some of the other problems. Um, so you'll notice, right, these, these higher density bands. Um, so these are places, so for Canada in particular, there's a very high, high density band over a good fraction of Canada's uh, population, right? Um, and this is a choice that has been made by uh, satellite companies. Um, and that means that we also have the highest density of, uh, of satellites because we have the highest density of satellites over us, we're also most at risk for space junk. Here's another way of looking at this, this plot um, just uh, as, as a count per latitude, right? You can see there's these very high spikes. Um, okay, so, so there's a lot of stuff in low Earth orbit. Um, this is uh, updated very recently. Uh, this is the number of objects versus year. Um, and uh, there's uh, abandoned rocket bodies. These are just left in space after they launch something. Um, these are the actual satellites. Uh, this is junk that has been tracked. There's a lot of smaller pieces. I think uh, radar can only track down to 10 centimeters or so in size. So there's a lot of smaller pieces that can still do damage that are not tracked. And then this is the total. Um, so you'll notice some jumps here. This is uh, a Chinese anti-satellite test. I think the US and probably another country had also done anti-satellite tests earlier, but they didn't, just because of the way they did it, they didn't produce a huge amount of debris that stayed in orbit. Um, this was a collision between two satellites in 2009, uh, between uh, an active satellite and a dead satellite. Um, and this was the recent Russian anti-satellite test um, a few months ago. Uh, and uh, this is sometimes referred, you can see this is the, the huge increase in the number of, of satellites. This is sometimes called new space because now most of the satellites that are being placed in orbit are being placed by private companies, not by governments, right? So it, it really has changed uh, what's, what's happening in orbit. Um, okay, so here's another way of looking at the number of objects in orbit. This is um, just as uh, how many objects there are at different orbital heights. Um, uh, and then th this is just sort of smeared out over orbits uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the densities differently. Um, right, so the, the red points are these leftover rocket bodies, dead satellites, blue points are active satellites, uh, and then um, the black points are from the Russian anti-satellite test. Uh, <laughs> this, this little spike right here is Starlink, right? You can little spike, you can see that it is um, or, like almost an order of magnitude higher density than anything else. Uh, so, you know, all of this, there's a bunch of debris that's also in orbit. Um, uh, that is not trackable. Even little tiny bits of debris could cause um, severe damage to satellites. We could already be in what's called um, Kessler syndrome. 
um, where if you have two satellites smash into each other, makes a bunch of debris, smashes more satellites, um, and uh, and so on, right? Um, this is a terrifying website. So this is real data in real time. Um, so I'm showing my time, but uh, so so this is all of the all of the stuff in orbit, all of the close passes between stuff in orbit, right? So this is in kilometers. This is real time. Uh, so you can see like in the next few minutes, there will be several uh, passes within one to two kilometers um, between stuff in orbit that is tracked, right? Uh, the terrifying numbers of close passes. So, you know, one to two kilometers doesn't sound like that much, but these things are all traveling at, you know, nine or 10 kilometers per second. This is very close. We're right on the edge of catastrophe all the time. Um, so, yeah, so, so the Starlink satellites in particular are in such a dense orbit that they have to actively change their orbits to avoid colliding with each other. Um, we're coming up to solar maximum. What happens when half of their satellites get uh, put into safe mode for a few hours and cannot change their orbits? I have not, I have directly asked uh, representatives from satellite companies this question and they have not given me a satisfactory answer. Uh, and I think that Starlink losing an entire batch of satellites to a small solar storm in February uh, really quite uh, clearly demonstrates that they are not thinking about this. Um, so another problem is atmospheric pollution, right? Uh, so we talked about how the satellites are, are uh, throwaways. Um, so they're planning for five years uh, for each satellite. So that's great for them because they can update them. No big deal if they lose 10% of their satellites on launch, which they have so far. Um, uh, but you know these satellites are not small. Uh, if you're planning to deorbit and reorbit uh, and orbit more satellites, so deorbit 42,000 satellites by burning them up in the upper atmosphere, right? Uh, they don't go away. They deposit that mass in the upper atmosphere. Uh, that comes out to 23 satellites a day on average, or six tons of satellites per day. They're mostly aluminum. That's way more than the natural amount of aluminum that is deposited in the atmosphere by meteoroids. So uh, what's that going to do? <laughs> Low Earth orbit is not considered an environment, so they have not done an environmental assessment. They don't have to. Um, this is one of those like last ditch geoengineering ideas is like put a bunch of aluminum in the upper atmosphere. What is that actually going to do? Nobody knows. They're just going to do it. Um, so uncontrolled re-entries, right? Uh, the, the rocket bodies that launch these are often just left. Um, this was a, a re-entry of a Falcon 9 rocket um, in, uh, oops, let me just turn that off. Uh, uh, this was filmed over Vancouver, right? This is what, what a SpaceX rocket burning up in the atmosphere looks like. Um, and uh, this, this particular rocket landed in a farmer's field in Washington state, right? So. Um, there, uh, what happens when it crashes into somebody's house? Who's who's liable? Um, the only uh, time that this has ever been tested was uh, in the late 70s when a Soviet nuclear powered satellite crashed into Canada and sprayed nuclear waste across a huge fraction, uh, a huge area of Canada. Um, the Soviet Union offered to come help clean it up and Canada said, no, thanks. We don't want to see, uh, we don't want you to see the giant American radar dishes that we've got up there. Uh, so uh, Canada got paid some piddly amount of money for cleanup, but um, that, that is, uh, you know, this, the, these treaties were written in a time when it was between governments. Governments were the only launchers. So what happens when a SpaceX rocket crashes into somebody's house in China? Who's liable? Is the, the U.S. government? Is it? <laughs> do they pay the Chinese government? Right? Like, what happens? This is an area like space law is going to grow massively in the next few years, and this will be challenged. Um, okay, so the night skies are changing right now. Um, this is what my sky looks like right now. This is with the um, the Mega Constellation app. Uh, this is what it would look like with sixty five thousand satellites. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to miss a huge number of science opportunities because of this, right? Um, uh, I'll just highlight one, <laughs> Planet Nine, right? Like, I think you guys just had a talk about Planet Nine, right? So I'm kind of on the other side of things with Planet Nine. But like, still, in order to detect Planet Nine or not, you need uh, really good surveys where you know all of your biases. All of a sudden, we have another bias being added in. Uh, so we're not, we're not going to be able to, to do that science. Um, 
The one that keeps me awake at night, though, is potentially hazardous asteroids, right? Uh, Near-Earth asteroids. We are flying through, orbiting through the sea of, of asteroids all the time. Um, if we detect one early enough, we can uh, mitigate it, right? So the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite, um, right, that, that caused a huge amount of damage and injured a huge number of people. If they had seen it coming beforehand, or if it was slightly bigger, you know, they could evacuate the city or tell people to get away from windows, right? That could have saved a huge number of injuries. Um, if there's an even bigger one, we can maybe change its orbit if we find it early enough. Um, but now we're making it harder. It's like, you know, <laughs> your windshield's getting dirtier and dirtier and you're still trying to keep driving. So it's it's not safe. We have the the uh, the ability to uh, to avoid these catastrophes and we're making it harder for ourselves. Um, OK, so here's a whole I don't expect you to read this whole list, but uh, this is just some of the stuff that I know professional astronomers are working on right now. Um, you know, software mitigations. Um, it, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Um, the, uh, there's, um, you can look up when satellites are going to pass over. You can maybe try to avoid them. There's a lot, though. Uh, you can observe satellites and make sure that they're actually as faint as they're supposed to be and on the orbits that they say that they're supposed to be on. Um, we've had lots of trying to talk to satellite companies, I personally think that that is not helping anymore because they say that they're listening to us, but they are not listening to us. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure where to go with that next. Um, uh, I actually had a meeting with a whole bunch of representatives from different parts of the Canadian government. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we talked about uh, you know, it can't just be one country, right? Like, so if Canada puts in great rules and says, okay, you're, you're ruining the night sky, so you have to pay astronomers, right? Like a classic pollution problem. Um, then Starlink will just say, eh, we don't really need to broadcast to Canadians. So then we get all of the downsides and none of the benefits, right? So that's no good. Uh, it has to be international. Um, there is a new International Astronomical Union Center um, specifically for uh, satellite constellations. Um, and this will be a huge repository of information for, uh, for astronomers um, and hopefully a way for us to get together better and try to fight this uh, together. Um, but this is, this is just ramping up right now. Um, and okay, so all of you watching right now, um, so these are, you know, giant corporations headed by billionaires. Uh, they will only respond to international legislation, which is extremely slow. It will take years um, and to consumer pressure, right? Um, they, they are, are uh, profit driven companies. Uh, so uh, I'll just say, if you have alternates, don't use satellite internet. Um, but, um, you know, I, I also realized like that is uh, the only option in a lot of places. Um, so if you do use Starlink, uh, tell them that it is important for them to make their satellites fainter, right? Like SpaceX has absolutely fantastic engineers, incredible, right? They land rockets on drone ships in the ocean. That's crazy. They can figure out how to make their satellites fainter, right? They can do it. This is just not a priority for them. They can figure out how to use fewer satellites to provide good service. Um, but that's not a priority for them. If that, that is made a priority for them by their consumers, then, uh, then I, I think they can focus on that more. Um, <clears throat> tell people what's happening. Most people have no idea that this change is coming. Um, <clears throat> talk to your government representatives, um, uh, right? Like uh, where I live, outside, a ways outside a city, um, right? Like it's all open farmland around me. My nearest neighbor is, is a, a kilometer away. Um, and uh, I can connect my house to a natural gas line or to uh, electricity or uh, telephone lines, but I cannot connect to broadband internet, right? So this, this is an infrastructure problem. Uh, it, it's one that has been neglected by governments for a long time. And it's one that, that needs to be, um, uh, updated uh, for, for rural and remote people. Um, so those of you who are astronomers, um, please continue using your skills to show people the beautiful night sky and go out and enjoy it yourself because it is changing right now. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, just going to read uh, one quote. We are on the threshold of fundamentally changing a natural resource that since our earliest ancestors has been a source of wonder, storytelling, discovery, and understanding of ourselves and our origins. We transform that at our peril. 
Um, right, so we shouldn't have to choose between astronomy and internet, right, with better engineering cooperation between satellite operators. Um, we can we can still have both, uh, but we have to fight for it. So thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer some questions. Professor Lawler, thank you. For, that's very that that's important. That's um, a bit a bit unnerving, certainly concerning. Um, let me let me open the meeting up for questions. Also, a uh, great great many of us here are highly accomplished um, astro imagers. And as we go through, I'd very much like to hear about people's experiences and uh, judgments of this. So questions, please. I missed the size of the Starlink satellites. What is their size? Um, they're, they're uh, let's see. I know they're 260 kilograms, um, and I know that our our um, we came up with a size of four meters squared just by from our fitting. Uh, so that's that's approximately right. So they're pretty big. They're like car sized. I have a question. How do they, uh, especially Starlink and the big uh, constellations, how are they deorbiting them? After at their end of life, or are they deorbiting? They are deorbiting them, and they've actually specifically designed their satellites to burn up completely in the atmosphere, rather than you know dumping little bits down onto the ground. Uh, when you're talking about tens of thousands of satellites, that could kill people, right? Um, so uh, they're just—I mean, they just have—they have little thrusters, right? So they, you know, they launch the satellites onto these. Um, into these Starlink trains, right, where they're very low altitude, and then they slowly rise up with their, their thrusters, and then they stay in orbit for five years or uh, a week, depending on if they worked or not. And then they they get um, pushed, they, they use their thrusters to, to get back down to the point where they'll get dragged into Earth's atmosphere and burn up. Sounds like you have a lot of experience and dialogue with the Starlink company. What about some of these others that you sh showed on that slide? Um, okay, so my my experience has just been at uh, conferences like SatCon and Dark and Quiet Skies. Um, so uh, so each of these companies, so OneWeb, Kuiper, and Starlink have sent representatives to all of these conferences that I have gone to, which is fantastic, and I um, very much appreciate that. But um, in my experience. The representatives that they have sent have not been maybe the best people to send right it's it sort of feels like they just sort of pick someone random and like okay it's your turn to go talk to the astronomers um <laughs> and and so like there's a lot of questions like we ask the we astronomers ask questions and they don't know or they you know can't tell us or so i don't know i like spacex especially is notorious for not being open with the press, with anyone, right? Uh, like anytime you see an article about SpaceX, there is a line in that article that says SpaceX did not respond to our request for comment every single time, right? Um, so, so they are not <laughs> not the best outreach people, right? It's not like you know. Can you imagine if NASA was launching satellites that were visible from the entire world, they would have an outreach team that would be in contact with governments and yeah. universities all over the world. They would be training people to, you know, look for these and get excited about them. SpaceX is doing literally nothing <laughs> to tell people what's happening. So, um, so yeah, so I have not had a great experience talking to these people. I think that there is a lot more that they need to do, but they're profit driven, not science driven, right? They have very different goals than, than NASA does. Is there any economic incentive to making the satellites smaller? And if that happened, let's say instead of, I don't know, I didn't figure out what we might have as a size there, but if they made them into, let's say, four by four cubes, because the electronics, the solar cell technology uh, is improving. And, you know, these yeah. companies, if there's an economic incentive, maybe they'll go there. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, um, 
So I am not an engineer. I will just say that. Uh, I, um, but yeah, any anything that makes these satellite companies um, have fewer satellites is better, right? Anything that um, that any way that they can have fewer satellites that that deals with the pollution issues, that deals with the space junk issues, that deals with the light pollution issues, right? Um, any of that will be better if they use fewer satellites. So any like. Um, you know, the pro it's, it's very similar to the leap in technology with LEDs, right? So SpaceX built these rockets that are reusable. So suddenly it is so much cheaper to launch satellites. So they just launch them, no big deal, whatever, you know, $10 million down the toilet, no big deal. We'll just launch more, right? Um, so, so, uh, so that's, you know, that leap in technology has suddenly made this kind of uh, light pollution much more feasible. But yeah, if they, if they, uh, they do have some economic benefit uh, to launching fewer satellites, but not enough right now. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was asking particularly, my guess is they probably won't want to launch fewer satellites. Yeah. But, they, but if the smaller satellites, uh, you know, cause the electronics gets better and better and yeah. better and better. And maybe you could get enough power you know, we, instead of having a whole, you know, that visor sat that you showed, um, yeah. you could just have a four inch cube. Yeah, Four totally. inch on a side if, yeah. cube, you know. Um, I don't know, that would be uh, 600 square centimeters, I guess. Um, yep, yeah, Any anything like that. Any, any technology change that makes them smaller would also help. That doesn't really help with the, the um, so it doesn't help with the launch pollution issue, but it uh, it and it wouldn't probably wouldn't help that much with space junk, right? Because there's still lots of stuff orbiting at you know several kilometers per second, but um, it would help for the uh, the light pollution. So that makes me happy. <laughs> Did you say something more about the aluminum problem? Um, is aluminum just in atomic form? Will it remain in the upper atmosphere, or will it diffuse to? lower levels or possibly come back to to uh our atmosphere immediately yeah. okay so so i'm totally not an expert on this this is just something that um this is like you know order of magnitude back of the envelope kind of calculations um as you know uh i am not trained as an atmospheric scientist um this is something that an atmospheric scientist needs to be paid to look at right uh, but but um uh, again, like uh, SpaceX does not have to do that. So, um, so it is entirely possible based on reading that I have done that this aluminum could form alumina, right? Which is, which is really good at reflecting sunlight and could drop the temperature of the earth if there's enough of it in the atmosphere, right? That's, that's kind of the, the crazy geoengineering idea. Um, but again, like what is the, what is the cycle time? How long does it stay up there? How does it get out? Like, I don't know any of that. And that's something that, um, that, uh, that SpaceX should be paying some scientists to look at. Um, again, like there's this, you know, such a huge disparity in the money involved here, right? Like, uh, SpaceX is headed by literally the richest person in the world, um, and us astronomers are, you know, funded on our tiny little grants <laughs> from, from taxpayers, and we're trying to fight against that, and it's it's really hard. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if uh, one one possible thing that would help is if low Earth orbit is recognized legally as an environment, because then it would be subject to environmental regulations and they would have to actually do these, these simulations properly. Um, and there is a court case in the US right now that could possibly decide that, but I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't checked in on how that's going lately. Um, it's a little fishy because it's one mega constellation company suing another mega constellation company to try to get uh, legal recognition uh, for space as an environment. But, uh, you know, I guess that's in the right direction. So it's good. <laughs> uh, from a legal perspective, does admiralty law pertain in space? I mean, that was in the Martian. But, yeah. I mean, um, ships are used to colliding and things. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, the, the, so I know that rules in space, laws in space are very, very weird. Um, like, uh, I don't, it's not quite the same as like out on the open ocean, but it's um, like, uh, 
you know, if you, you as an American go into space and uh, you shoot someone and kill them, uh, the US government is liable for that murder, not you, <laughs> right? Like there's no individuals in space. There are governments. The governments are the only recognized entities right now legally. So that has to change, right? Because because uh, there's going to be a lot of weird stuff happening soon. But um, yeah, right now the, the legality of space is a mess and it's uh, going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years. I just did a little chemistry and physics. Okay. Uh, to to address, to come back to the question of aluminum in the atmosphere. Aluminum uh, mostly forms oxides, and uh, I think alumina is Al2O3. So it strikes yeah. me as it's a pretty heavy molecule. And my guess is, from the physics part, that it will settle out. As long as it's not bounced up by Brownian motion the way aerosols are. Yeah, yeah. So, but I don't know what that settling time might be. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, is it is it less than five years? Is it? What, I like. I have no idea. This is a good, this is something a good research that research project for an undergraduate student, I think. <laughs> or or someone like someone who studies climate science is probably already equipped to do this very easily, right? But. Uh, but this, these private companies should be paying scientists to do this, right? This shouldn't be on the public dime. <laughs> uh, I, I have a, a question which may seem uh, stupid to people like uh, Mike who have backgrounds in uh, physics. Is, is there any chance that all this aluminum up there might uh, mitigate global warming? <laughs> yeah, so that's that's uh, one th I, I have thought about this, um, right? So, uh, and like I said, that was, yeah, I don't know. Have, has anybody read uh, the Neil Stevenson book, Termination Shock? It just came out. Um, it's a, a climate science fiction book. It's, it's very good. Um, but yeah, it, it talks about a lot of the, the complications of trying to uh, regulate Earth's atmosphere with uh, with geoengineering, right? So like, yeah, maybe. I mean, like, that's the direction that uh, my, like, bad back of the envelope calculation suggests that it might go. But like, let's really, like, do I really want, like, do we as a, as a planet really want that to be like a side effect of a billionaire's company's project? Like, uh, this is this is bad this is bad <laughs> so um so yeah it's possible but uh i don't think that's a very good way to do it <laughs> yeah it's this is, yeah something it's that going needs to be in, studied yeah it's going in the, in the right direction as samantha mentioned the geoengineering and one of the conspiracies going on in some people's eyes well let's not stop making co2 let's just make the atmosphere more reflect reflective but if you do that, the stuff eventually settles down. You got to keep putting more and more yep. up there while you get more and more CO2. And if you ever stop making the atmosphere reflective, then you suddenly heat up like a, a furnace because you got so much CO2 in your atmosphere. And it's a really bad idea. Yeah. This much so aluminum looks like too small an amount yet to matter to me. But later on down the line, yes, it would act contrary to global warming and then make you feel all warm and fuzzy about lots of CO2 and then it's like committing climate suicide. So you know, people try yeah. to avoid that. Yeah, you should definitely read uh, Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson. It's, it, it talks about all of this in a, you know, wrapped up in a, a lovely science fiction novel, so. <laughs> I have a question. Could, can, could a case be made to put fewer satellites but put them further away where they have a greater coverage like you know geo geo uh synchronous orbit yeah is there any motivation well, so in doing that yeah so geosynchronous orbit would be fantastic but um what i hear over and over from satellite operators is latency right so uh so geosynchronous orbit is at uh i i should know it but 12 about 22,000 miles 22,000 uh, right. kilometers right and these are at 550 right so right. it takes light long enough <laughs> to get out there and back that you do have uh, a like slightly laggy internet but there are internet providers that work from geosynchronous orbit and yeah. that's fantastic um but uh you know i heard over and over from i, I think it was the viasat ceo who kept saying like oh you can't check your bank account if there's a half second delay and like why don't they 
fix their website so you can do that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so so yeah, so so that is totally a possibility. Um, geosynchronous orbit is the only part of orbit that is tightly regulated because it is you know such a narrow band of real estate. Um, so yeah, so this is just a totally different, uh, totally different kind of land grab <laughs> that's happening now. Uh, but it is possible. Well, e even uh, geosynchronous satellites are not a total walk in the park for astronomers. I know, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, at least from my latitude, uh, I'm slightly north of Palomar. It's, uh, I'm 33 and a half degrees north. Uh, there are geosynchronous satellites which interfere with the imaging the Orion Nebula. Yeah. Mm. They sit right on top of it, and I had an awful time trying to remove them from my images. Huh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that is true. You see it, you see a good many around Orion. There are other orbits too, like Molniya orbits that will yeah. that that are they're sort of like a comet, you know, they have a long dwell time and they yep. scoot around. Yeah, I think isn't the the test the test tel telescope is in some mm -hmm. kind of orbit like that, I yeah. think. Yep. Um, let me step in and answer a couple of the questions that have come up here. Uh, Mike, uh, they may, SpaceX is making their satellites as small as they can. There's incentive for them to do that because uh, economically they got to stuff as many of the satellites in one uh, launch nose cone as they can. And why is it limited by the size? Uh, given the altitude that they're at, and the speed that they need to talk to their customers and the number of customers they expect to simultaneously be using a satellite, there is a minimum of power that they need to broadcast at radio, which means there's a minimum size for the, the uh, uh, solar panel. And so that's why they can't make them tiny satellites. Um, the uh, there's one other problem with geosynchronous uh, altitude, and that is uh, it's uh, 30 times as far away as the uh, Starlinks from their customer, and therefore they have to use a thousand times the uh, electrical power, and so you have to have a monster satellite in geosync to cover the same thing that these low altitude starlinks do. So that's that's their incentive. Thanks. Connell, do you have do you have a particular involvement with uh, with this issue? I mean professionally or otherwise? Uh, no, I'm just an electrical engineer who's been following it because I'm an amateur astronomer. Thank you. <laughs> ah, good. Thank you. Um, does any of this have implication? I mean, we've talked about uh, astronomy at visual wavelengths and, and mm -hmm. at near infrared. Um, is there any threat, or any any implications for <clears throat> radio astronomy, or yes. or are things? Oh, that's a good question. You know, yeah. th things bound it you know, bands of frequencies. What about a radio astronomy? Yeah, totally. Um, so so I should I should add that to my talk as a disclaimer that like I am an optical and infrared astronomer, so I don't think about radio very much, but I gave this talk at a radio observatory um, a, a few months ago and learned. Um, so one, you know, so all, so the, the radio bands that they're gonna broadcast in are already like you can't observe in radio. Uh, you can't observe astrophysical sources in radio at those wavelengths anyway. Um, it's possible that more of the ground-based uh, radio bands will get allocated to space as more and more satellites use them. Um, but the biggest threat is actually from reflections of, of radio, uh, of ground-based radio broadcasts off of the satellites which I had no idea that was a problem, right? But I guess that's something that, that they see a lot like with uh, a jet flying over or something, it actually reflects back 
uh, ground-based radio broadcasts that you wouldn't be able to see from a radio quiet space. Um, so if there's, you know, it, like those plots that I showed, right, there's many, many more satellites down low on the horizon. They're going to be reflecting radio broadcasts from very far away, uh, well outside the radio quiet zone. So that's actually the part that they're most worried about. Uh, I thought that was that was pretty interesting. I know a lot of amateur radio operators and long distance communicators have used meteorite trails to bounce signals off of. Wow. And of course, oh, yeah. me meteorite trails are more coherent, but I suppose if you get enough really little satellites up there and you're dealing with long enough uh, wavelength radio waves, you could, you could probably find ham radio operators bouncing their uh, over the yeah. horizon signals off of uh, small satellites like that. I'm not a skilled enough radio operator to know whether that would work or not, but it sounds like a thing they try to do. Yeah. VHF media burst communications used to be very viable and you'd use it. They wouldn't have internet data rates, but they were good for places like Brazil, you know, uh -huh. where, which is the, which is a satellite problem. Right, you're not going to have radio towers and coverage and so forth. But it, but it, uh, the communications was VHF. Hmm. Who's barking? Anyway, uh, Professor um, Miller, thank you, thank you very much. You've been very, very kind to share this time with us, and um, you've really raised some issues that I think all of us uh, are concerned with. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you all for listening. And like, especially, yeah, those of you who are, are amateur astronomers and share your time, share your telescopes with the general public and work in public outreach, just thank you so much. What you are doing is so important. Um, so please keep doing it. Uh, the the loss of the night sky is really really sad but people won't even notice if they don't uh if they aren't shown it by skilled people like you so thank you very true very true nice uh, to see another spitzer colleague <laughs> yeah <laughs> good, good. well with that i'd like i'd like to wind the meeting down let me <clears throat> let me close with a word about our next meeting. Um, the Greenway Talks online will continue on Saturday, June 4th, two weeks from now, when Dr. Linda Bilker, Cassini project scientist, research fellow, and senior research science, scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will join us for a discussion of the continuing research being done and the new knowledge being gained from the vast archive of data and images created during the 20 year Cassini mission. New insights are being gained as the research continues. Her presentation is titled, Surprises in the Saturn System updates on Cassini discoveries. So again, thank you, Dr. Samantha Lawler. And my thanks as well to everybody for joining and supporting the Greenway Talks online. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again in two weeks. So bye-bye. Have a, have a good weekend. <laughs>